So I, I always have a hard time in, in a lot of gun groups just like kind of keeping my mouth shut on. You have the, the, the cake baker and you have the cake decorator, right? Yep. And, and everybody shits on the guys that don't bake their own cake. Yeah. <laughs> but on, on the other hand, you'll go into a lot of these shops. When you get a part, you have to have the ability to inspect it, right? You could have all the tolerancing, all the GDNT in the world. If you do not have the ability to properly check that part, it doesn't matter, you know? So it, that, that's the things that kind of drive me crazy. Well, so-and-so does this. I'm like, it's having a made at a shop that has CMMs, has touch probes, has all those things. Um, <clears throat> so like just... Should be, yeah. Are you drinking my water? Yeah, right. thank you. I was a little thirsty. Check these check. chairs. None of these couches or chairs pro promote good posture. I was gonna sit like this, but it's, uh, you can. It's really comfortable when you do that. Is it? <laughs> oh, it actually <laughs> is pretty comfy. <laughs> I enjoy it. That's cool. How do I look? It's professional. Thank you. So it's a collar it's, shirt on, and I. Had no, I, I, I like your shirt though. It's yeah. pretty sweet. Run yeah. CNC. Yeah, we, we did a bunch yeah, those of those. <laughs> That's cool. I, it's kind of weird. I've got to. It's going to take me a minute to get in the flow because I'm not. We're not sitting right. Yeah, we're not in the right. We're order, totally dude. flipped on how we normally. We have a we have a studio at the at the warehouse. Yeah, and we always sit in like the same seats, and it's actually. And so of, this is a different view. Yeah. That I'm. We've got to rearrange the whole. <laughs> Start over. I freak out whenever <laughs> something's not in in the right place. So, Dave, right? Yes, sir. You are with Next Level... Everything. Everything. Yes. Next Level Manufacturing, Next Level Armaments, what we're here for today, though. Cool, yeah. dude. Yeah. How long have you been... Uh, well, tell, tell us a little bit about Dave. Uh, well, I started out as a genuine street scrub kid, you know, doing all the stupid shit that kids do, and uh, going to the alternative school and doing all the stupid shit there, and kind of... Uh, had a kid at a very early age and got a job in a machine shop. And uh, I have a very good skill set of organizing things and throughput and just kind of naturally look at that like I'm at the casino. Like I wonder what throughput is and how fast they're going to go through the airport. I just that's how my mind always works. Um, so I started on the floor, like sweeping the floor and that kind of stuff. And then moved to the assembly area, moved to the lays. Took some metallurgy classes, did a bunch of uh, sales out of the area. So, like, I would work my full shift, and then I would call companies in California mm -hmm. after hours, different time zone. Started getting in RFQs um, after a few years out on the shop floor. Started doing purchasing, all that stuff. So, I really learned everything out on the shop floor, every aspect of the business. So, um, <clears throat> after that, started doing sales for that company, and uh, then they... So they didn't have a commission program at the end of the year. That was kind of the agreement to get paid on at the end of the year. Uh, so we parted ways. And then I was hired in another CNC shop to diversify them. Um, we did a great job of that. We were growing to about 35% a year. Uh, got them into uh, the medical industry, uh, a lot of aerospace. And uh, things went really well. Some things changed with ownership, stuff like that. And uh, we were in a meeting and... Uh, there was a friend of mine that did a lot of wire burn uh, outsourcing and a customer supplied a gauge and the gauge had worn over time and he said, make it with this gauge. And this is a massive medical company. And uh, I just decided to throw the part on a comparator and check it and I'm like, these aren't good. And uh, I called the customer and the customer's like, completely our fault. We will pay the bill, not an issue. Perfect. Well then my boss calls me into a meeting with the wire burn shop and he says, we didn't get paid on that. We're not paying the bill. And I said, I quit. He's fucking lying. So I walked out of that job, and that was 08. So I had a non-compete. Can't do anything in machining. That's all I've ever done. Uh, I sat in my underwear and figured out how to do federal contracting at home. In 08, the government was spending shit tons of money. So <laughs> Yeah, we were. It was, it was, it was a great time. Thank you, g <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I did... Uh, Everything, night vision to the FBI. I've done all, you name an agency, I've worked with them. Uh, one of the coolest programs we did was uh, FEMA. 
So that at the time, I think Craig Fugate was in charge. And after Hurricane Katrina, he said, we completely fell on our face. What can we do to recover? Um, we came up with infant and toddler kits. That's all premix formula, every nipple, every diaper size, everything you can ever imagine. And those were going to go to stage areas and it worked flawlessly. Um, then the first time they went to exercise that contract, there was obviously it's a government contract. So there's a few suppliers it's back up. And, uh, in Michigan where I live, we got a complete biz blizzard, like Chicago shut down, like everything shut down, nothing was open. And they called and asked if we could still fill that contract. So I went to every store I could go to and bought all of the things like I'm like Walmart's <laughs> buyers, yeah. like, literally Snap. everybody in line. Like that's just fighting to get out to the store. Absolutely hates me because they're waiting in line and I'm buying like 600 bottles at every store I can put it all together in my garage. I rented a uh, skid steer with track on it <laughs> and FEMA literally drove to the exit by my house uh, <laughs> semi and I loaded up all the skids and they got the stuff out. I always looked at that contract. If I don't do my job, these kids aren't going to eat, right? Yeah. So it was always pretty serious to me. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So I did that for a while. The company I had worked for then sold uh, to a private equity business. And then I was able to go out on my own and start a machine shop. And, uh, yeah, it's been really nice. Cool. Um, building that company culture is, is really cool to be able to do. Um, the mentality in the machining world is our toolboxes have wheels on it for a reason. So I can go get another job and I wanted to create like a place where people go to work and retire from, uh, in Michigan. I mean, there's a shop on every corner. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. It's not like down by you guys. It's, <laughs> a, it's absolutely insane. Yeah. So <clears throat> we've done a really good job of that. Our core team has been fantastic. Our, you know, quality guy, you know, he started out just running lays you know learned everything from the ground up everybody's been promoted from within we don't really go outside and grab anybody and bring them in so that works out really nice i mean their mentality is you're going to spend more time with these people than anybody else in your life yeah let's That's make it good. very true fact so yep we've been very fortunate for that the COVID stuff got super weird. Uh, <laughs> like the older generation, we have a very young staff in comparison to a lot of shops, but you have like the GM toolmen and all these type of guys. They're just sick of it. You know, they're like, we're done. Like we're going to work a couple extra years. Um, and they were like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Yeah. So they just left. Uh, so we really got into a lot more automation, pallet pools, uh, part density, that kind of stuff. So, uh, worked out really well for us. So we still have our core team that does very well. Uh, one of the things we do differently than any other shop that I know of is the profit sharing. So we do a third goes to the employees, a third goes to new equipment, and a third stays in the bank for the oh shit fund. So they really care about what they make. They don't make junk. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice. Like I said, I can get a program. If I do my job properly, I can throw it over the wall, and I never hear anything. So... That's cool. I know they ask you a lot of questions when they're going through <laughs> processing and doing things and having the whole armament side. When we do white box stuff, we know what the parts are. We know what aesthetically has to be right, you know, in comparison to some other shops. It's going to be like, well, I made it to print. My glass surface finish looks like shit on the outside. Yeah. Well, it doesn't do anything. I'm like, your customer wants open jewelry. Yeah. yeah. Every time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. So, yeah. <clears throat> then, then you get into uh, the next level armament piece, which is, you know, kind of – birth the dot of necessity i guess yeah um we have a lot of people request for you know make this make that for the firearms industry we had a gentleman approach us i want to make 500 uppers lowers i want to make 500 bolt carriers charging handles blah 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 so we got some specialty equipment we turned down the uppers and lowers and had somebody on the east side of the state uh run those and then uh, we ran everything and uh he never paid a bill um, this gentleman went on to, uh, work for the, uh, NRA and, uh, is being investigated for other scandals since then <laughs> in the NRA and got promoted. Meanwhile, he's getting investigated. They just kept bumping him up. So that was kind of shocking. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Shocking. I love, love that. He didn't just retire. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he was close with that guy. Uh, yeah. so anyways, um, we kind of were like, what are we going to do? Right. We're sitting here with all these pieces, parts, uh, the guy that was on the east side of the state that ran the uppers and lowers, he called me. He's like, I'm going to go out of business. This is not a good situation. I said, tell you what, 
we're going to go to market for ourselves. And we started with the AR-10 platform. Um, we're not going to do the AR-15 right away. So we will sell all those receiver sets with what we have. And uh, we did that. This is back when you could do like Facebook groups and all, yeah, this, yeah, all that yeah. stuff was gravy and just throw it out. Hey, and yeah, we, we moved uh, all, all those receiver sets and all the parts. Um, and then we went to market with AR-10 and uh, that went fantastic. And then we eased our way into the AR-15 and, uh, and everything else. So um, one of the things that kind of put us on the map was us being able to grab things from other platforms that weren't up to par when they came out um mcx i had uh you know when they first came out we were at a show and i had a couple of buddies that had them and the back of that carrier group is delrin right i'm like this is a 2200 dollars rifle with a delrin piece as one of your most important components um so we took that and it was a fun project <clears throat> I'm, I'm kind of a, a weirdo in the groups like i went in the sig groups and i'm like who has this gun and 10 people would respond and I'm like, I'm going to send you a part, please shoot the shit out of it and let me know what you think. So I replaced that with a 4140 pH, um, material. So we only sell one of them ever because they don't break. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which everybody's like, this kind of dumb. You should make it out of aluminum. I'm like, no, we don't make money machining them either, but it's a good thing in market presence and nobody's ever shit on that part in any group ever, you know? Um, so, we send those out, we get them tested, and a competitor uh, actually went in the group, uh, had one of their brothers order a part as a tester, mm. and then they went to production with that part. We had three rev changes that we had to change, so they went to market and they made like thousands of them oh. out of aluminum that didn't work and had a massive recall. Um, and oh, you, Yeah, you get into the SIG stuff and different gen things and all that fun stuff, so we figured all that fun stuff out and... So that was nice in that group. We got a good uh, presence, uh, SIG M&P 1522. A lot of guys run that as trainers. Um, that was one of the charging handles I thought we'd run like 100 of. I mean, we run thousands of those things, you know, just a fully ambi that mirrors your controls on everything else. So those have been very good. Uh, SIG MPX lifter blocks. Um, so that has a lifter in the back of it that mitigates a gas blowback and also provides you support when charging your rifle instead of it flopping around all over the place in the first couple of gens. Um, that's made of 4140, same thing. Don't make any money machining it, but we own that market, you know, yeah. so that's always, always good. We don't like customer returns. So. Yeah. And those, <laughs> those are marketed under your own brand. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Next armament. So, and we sell, you know, th thousands of AR-15 charging handles a week. I mean, we run just thousands of pieces, parts, uh, for other people in the industry and, uh, our own. So MPX, MCX, M&P 1522, Mutant. AR-15 and AR-10 charging handles. Um, those are all under our brand. Um, we're very good at developing, <clears throat> engineering, machining. We're terrible at marketing. So I'll, I'll admit it. I, sp I spent all my time out in the shop. Like when, when I call you and I'm like, yeah. hey, how, how, do you, how many of these are you going to order? And having the conversation of the long-term project so I can plan accordingly to meet your needs. Yeah. You know, uh, good example of that is like uh reptilia they do a fantastic job for special customers at hey we want this yeah and i'm like okay how long are we running this how long is it going to go on for is it going to the consumer market because then i can run it on a rotary and i can go through and make sure everything's good there and then we can migrate it to a pallet pool run lights out you know um and getting that feedback from them saves them money on fixturing tooling i mean like when I talk to you and I'm mm -hmm. like, are you going to run this for a while? Yep. Okay, cool. I'm not going to charge you two grand for tooling. I'll just make it because we're probably going to run this for five years. Yeah. So having those conversations <coughs> is, is kind of, I don't know, some customers are like, why do you need to know all this? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm just trying to help you, man. Yeah. Now, um, do we want to get into the, he makes the barricade stop, correct? Yeah. So he's making the barricade stop. He's working on the 625 uh, gas block that we have. Okay. Um, and then I think the angle cutie mount mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only projects that we have mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. We got some more coming. Yeah. We're going to keep you busy. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I said it's, a, it's all about the spindle time for the people down on the floor um, and, and keeping those guys busy. So and my shot show is way different than your guys'. Yeah. I literally go booth to booth talking about making parts for people. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a little different, but it's it's good. That's cool. So so a couple terms that I want you to go into because I'm interested. Tell me about what the difference is between the rotary and the pallet pull, and 
you said running lights out. Do you want to go there, man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do because so, it's interesting. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, so I, I always have a hard time in, in a lot of gun groups just, like, kind of keeping my mouth shut on – you have the, the, the cake – baker and you have the cake decorator right yep. and, and everybody shits on the guys that don't bake their own cake yeah. <laughs> but on, on the other hand you'll go into a lot of these shops when you get a part you have to have the ability to inspect it right mm -hmm. you could have all the tolerancing all the gd and t in the world if you do not have the ability to properly check that part it doesn't matter you know so that, that that's the things that kind of drive me crazy like well so-and-so does this i'm like he's having it made at a shop that has cmms has touch probes has all those things um <clears throat> so like just for example there's only one forge right like in the in the whole world that's where everybody gets their <laughs> shit right there's not obviously <laughs> but we started moving away from the variance work and we don't do any variance work anymore everybody is requesting forgings um and i run a preemptive op to inspect the forgings before we even touch them so basically what that is is you have a touch probe from Renishaw just like you'd have on a CMM inside of your CNC machine. And it beep, 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 boop, boop, goes along, touches off on everything. Hey, it's good. We're going to proceed in machine. Out of 1,000 forgings that we got in last time, there was just over 100 oh. that were good. Wow. So we've moved more towards, for, for our products, just doing the billet. I mean, you put them in, yeah. they run. Crank it Things out. are good. Um, the rotary, the horizontal – that kind of stuff, like if you get in, say, a part, and you run it in a standard mill, you know, you got your XY, you got your Z, and you're just machining one part, right? And it runs for, like, 20 minutes. And then you have somebody standing there that changes the part and does that all day long. Then you get into a rotary, so that adds an additional axis to it, right? So you can put multiple parts on there if you want, or you can just run one and be able to get to all sides of that. Um, and then you get into a horizontal, which is basically taking that rotary fixture, standing it up like this. Then you get into, so you're still indexing and running the part. Then you get into the pallet pool, which takes those fixtures. And we have three of the six pallets and two 11 pallets. So that's how many pallets are on each one of those machining centers. So I could put upper on one, lower on one your hand stops on the next one and it could cycle through all those parts lights out what that machine also has is tool brake detection so it'll go down a little laser pops up yeah. okay that needs to be offset this needs to happen so that gives you ability to run lights out and then also you have your touch probe in there you can go make sure things are good before you proceed with the subsequent operation so that works out really nice and you get into what we call part density <clears throat> so you have that face on every single one of your fixtures right so you have four sides or you could do octagon you can do whatever you want the more parts you can fit there the longer that tombstone's going to run mm -hmm. the less it has to be attended so super simple if you had 20 of these blocks that were running for 20 minutes in that first machine i was talking about and somebody's standing there changing it now that thing's running for hours now you run it on a six pallet station and that's shuttling in the pallets i think it takes 0.2 seconds and boom, it's already machining the next one. Boom, it's already machining the next one. So that's where you get into a lot more throughput with the same amount of people. What's hard for people to understand is like when I started in the industry, I don't know, 24 years ago, uh, shop rate was $60, $65 an hour. And that's still what it mostly goes for. A piece of equipment like that, uh, about six hundred thousand dollars. That's no tooling. That's no tombstones. That's no nothing. So by the time you get that thing tooled up and, and ready to go, you're you seven hundred grand deep easy. So it's uh, you have to really <laughs> look at that part density and attendance and things like that. I mean, employees' wages have went up. Electrics went up. Everything's yeah. went through the roof. So uh, yeah, the throughput stuff is is very very important in. Our shop kicks ass at it, man. They're, they're very, very good at it. And, um, again, that's why I ask so many questions on the front end and why I come out to SHOT Show and sit down. And we do a lot of pull systems for customers. So we'll have parts in certain stages that take the longest part of the cycle time. That way, if they ramp up an order, we just go, cool, the second op on that part, operation, is going to be two minutes. And then you have an outside service that's two weeks. We can have you parts in three, four weeks anytime you need them or whatever their needs may be. So. so what's an example of an outside service? 
will screw your parts up. That's what I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Swear to God, you, you make jewelry all day long, and I've seen uh, anodized come back just like. Yeah. And what's really frustrating is because that's at the most. That's, it's that a last stop. It's the most expensive that it yeah. is yeah. In, the, in the whole process. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. if it finished, screws it's it up. It's a kick in the it's, nuts. Yeah. yeah it's, there's, there's nobody that's consistently good at anodized that I've met in 20-some years. Yeah. Um, they'll knock it out of the park for like a couple weeks. I mean, I think it's another thing. It's gotten gradually worse. I know another guy we do a lot of white box for, and his hand guards came back looking like they were purple. I mean, there's 12 people that would buy those. <laughs> there is. <laughs> there's 12. I know. Literally we know dozen. one of them. I was going to say, yeah, somebody just sent out some FDE, and it came back, and it looked like the zombie green fad they, they yeah. used to have. I was like, how do you It's, how, a, it's how a retro. Even, how did you even do that? <laughs> like, we wanted tan. It came back slime green. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even a variant of FDE. Just like, a bit it, outside. It, it it's <laughs> outside the fucking box. So, yeah, we, we do a lot of stuff with uh, customers as far as planning and stuff when they get into – some of the uh, specialty contract stuff where they're doing surgeon sustains, things like that. Uh, obviously, I'm familiar with that from the federal contracting stuff, yeah. and that's why I kind of went there. Um, so you get a contract, and they're like, what if an uh, act of God happens? What's your plan? Yeah. And when you're running things for those type of customers, everything has to be DFARS, like U- U.S. source, you know what I mean, or an ally after the war, all that fun stuff. Um, so... We already kind of went through those exercises through COVID, right? <laughs> like we'd order like 7,000 series plate, and they're like, cool, we don't <laughs> have any. And I'm like, cool, do you have round stock? And they're like, yes. And I'm cool, I'm going to add two operations to be able to get these parts to my customer. So having, you know, backup resources and creating that documentation and getting that stuff ready for our customers is something we're very good at. So we'll put together – Kind of a packet for them. Our ERP is all real-time data collection, you know, so that's it's what goes around with the job of traveler and it has every operation, what happens, and then we go through in detail what a backup is for that, the redundancy we have, you know, so that's that's something I like to do. Again, I'm a manufacturing nerd and, and really enjoy that stuff. So when a customer says, can you help with this? I'm like, here you go. And That's cool. Yeah, next day they walk into this huge document of shit and they're like, what are you doing? I was like, I was already thinking about it all. Just my brain. I, I have a dumb question. So, <laughs> I already forgot it. <laughs> um, so, like, when, when you send something off for, like, anodizing. And it, Why you, do you keep bringing that? Because I just got an email about a shit, shit, <laughs> shit anodized job. <laughs> well, that, that's, it literally, that's what my, that's qu- the biggest, that's what my, biggest my, my question is, is, like. I don't know if I should read this text. Should I read this text to you of what the quality guy said? Sh- I mean, yeah. yeah. We can edit it out, right, if it's too bad? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everything's on fire, and the anodizing <laughs> came back slime. I, I, I literally just got this text. That's supposed to all be the same FDE. Oh, wow. Caps don't match this, don't match uh, that. None fuck. of the parts match. So, so, so you're bringing up a sore subject. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, that, this is, that's, it's perfect because that's what yeah. my question is. Is yeah. like, can So you machine those. Yeah, jewelry. Yeah, beautiful. Set them out in part separators, wrapped. Everything's perfect. <laughs> yeah. They will take all of that and shit out of there when they send it back so they hit each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, <laughs> do you, can you unfuck anodizing so you can? They, they strip and replate it. It never, it never looks the same. It never looks the but same. But does it take, like. Yeah, it changes the tolerance. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, does yeah, it you're change? You're stripping, you're removing yeah. material, yeah. you're adding. Yeah, you're screwing up your tolerance, and you're changing your screw hole sizes. I mean, so it's, like, it's oh, never God, good. That stresses me out so much. Well, I just showed you that text. I thought God. you knew about it. I was like, yeah. why does he keep honing in on anodizing? We, we, He's we over here. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we know about it, that. Because we get on, 50, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll get something in and open up three things, and it's just like that. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool sometimes when you have 50 shades of FDA yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on your rifle. Do I want lime green on my rifle? No. Like our eight position buffer. Buffer tubes came back, and uh, Frank called me up. He's like, hey, dude, um, we sent them off in the same batch. We got two totally different shades here. Yeah, like one's kind of goldish. And yeah, one's, one's yeah. more of a FDE. Yeah. But at least we're on. But they were they were nice shades. They yeah. Were, they, were, yeah. they were nice shades. And then on the retail side of that, we were able to flex and put, like, okay, now you can pick out FDE1 or FDE2. Yeah. Like, whatever you want. But yeah. something like that, like, so it takes it out, out of tolerance. Do you, you don't. There, I mean, there's potential. They're just junk. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to strip, it depends on how tight the tolerancing is. I mean, so then who fucking eats that? Do, does the anodizer? <laughs> that's, that's where the conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the go, conversation I'm having do right you now. Go to the anodizer and say, "Hey, you, you know, there's some. Bitch, yeah, like. there's, <laughs> there's some companies that are great at that stuff. We had um, 
an optics customer that we were doing a lot of live tooling blade stuff for, making all these fittings, and then all of a sudden there was like a material fracture. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, this isn't right. And uh, the material supplier stood behind it all. They sent it out for analysis. They're like, yeah, that was completely our fault. Here's the money. And I provided them a cost of the part of where I was at in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, the problem with any recovered cost is you really are losing, they say, like, a certain percentage. But you're losing three times what you've lost. You lost that lot order to be able to run it. Yeah. You're tying up your machine to rerun it. Yeah. And you're not running a new job on it. Yeah. So you're Opportunity costs and yeah, all that. You, yes. you got yes. some money back, but it's really not. Nothing. It's, it's you're you're still losing money at that point. Yeah. 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 I think we have a credit with, like, six anodizers right now that we won't ever use again <laughs> just because they... Uh, like one of them straight up like cooked. I was like, how long did you leave these in for? Like they were just like fracture cooked and like burnt. I was like, I don't, I don't even know how. You're like, that. I like my steaks. They're like we medium, could re <laughs> medium rare, and these things are like left jerky. in the sun. Yeah, yeah. beef jerky <laughs> buffer like, tubes. They're like we can re rerun them for you. You can send us replacements. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, because then you're just fucked I'm again. If they you more stuff for the fuck yeah. up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, like don't oh. let that guy on that shift. <laughs> oh cook those parts like here yeah. we'll send you more buffer tubes and then you fuck those up and then we're in the it, hole it's six times as much it, it it really is it's it's every outside service so we do uh used to do a gold um electro optics has this gold tube for a laser that runs through it through one of their uh, isolators not the the optics company but another electro optics that's uh does all high-end laser stuff and this tube had like 37 different dimensions and <laughs> You know, super fussy, tiny part. Everything's off center, so you can't just like run it on a lathe. You have yeah. these subsequent ops, and then you send it out for a super expensive gold process, and they would screw it up. So now you're gold deep, bad part deep, recovery. Customers are waiting five to six weeks for you to start. So, yeah. Thanks for bringing that what, up. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> when you said laser, I thought of Austin Powers, just by the way. Yeah. <laughs> this wore my mind instantly. <laughs> so I always do the laser same thing. Beam. Laser yeah. beams. And yeah, let, get, get into lasers. I mean, when we brought up the subject of, you know, a lot of these cake makers versus the, the cake decorator companies, you know, um, the ability to check parts, you know, like we have uh, Keyence Vision System that if a part has a hundred different dimensions on it, we can go in and program that thing and we can just lay them across this glass table. And through lasers, <laughs> using lasers, it goes through, it checks, it checks the parts in like, you know, a half a second and spits <laughs> out crazy. A, a, a green or red, you know. Go, go, so no go. Instead of somebody sitting there checking all those dimensions and writing it all down and doing all those things. So um, the ability that's to check wild. parts is, is very, very important in a shop. And that's, I think, one of the biggest weaknesses i see in a, a lot of other shops is they're yeah. just kind of like <clears throat> again if you don't have the touch probes you don't have the things inside of your machines to be running you know lights out you, you shouldn't be doing that um and uh, a lot of people do you know and that's where you'll get the the quality issues of well we set it up good but we ran a hundred through that cycle well tool broke on yeah. you know fourth one and you yeah, know, or war, and that's not quite yeah. right, and you know things like that. And so. then it somehow makes it to anodizing, and then you get it back, and you can't use it anymore. He keeps going with the anodized. Listen, it's man, <laughs> I have no control over that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, it's literally like one of the biggest problems that we see. Dude, it is the biggest problem for every industry. Yeah, and we and I'm, we get back. From we do people. inflate yeah. Wi-Fi connectivity, so you get on an airplane, right, and you got the internet and that radon on the top of it. We do that whole plate. Oh, wow. And then we make all the little fittings that go on there. We put it in a crate, ship it out. They do all their connections, store it on an airplane. And, yeah, it, it's great stuff. I have probably, I think that part's about 80 grand right now, what's into it, that a painter that did the paint on it dinged the piss out of it. So I'm going to turn it into a conference room table. So one of those. It, it's every outside service. So my question is. Is it about, about anodized? Well, he's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about to go not, fly into the window. To the big text <laughs> not, anodizing I mean, podcast. It's, it's not really a question, but it is about uh, anodizing. Should we just open our own fucking anodizing? No, oh, no. No. Do, no, bro. Do you know I what bought, anodizing I bought, entails? Uh, I bought a anodized system, and oh, I man. oh, I don't even want to tell this story. It hurts. So I yeah. bought. The, can I have show, one of those too? Yeah, show me on the dolly where they. <laughs> Dude, let me, let me tell you this story. It was the craziest shit ever. I had a breakfast sandwich this morning, and I feel like my brush still. I don't like, even know if I brush my teeth. It's okay. Can we edit that part out too? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> stays in. <laughs> so I ordered this anodized system from this guy in uh, I think it was Boston or something, uh, and he's answering my calls, answering my calls, <laughs> and uh, 
sends me all the quote, get everything ordered up, cool. He sends me over specs. I get everything squared away in the building. And then all of a sudden, he's always got an issue every time I call, and all of a sudden, he's not answering. And I'm like, oh, my God. So then he just goes, just completely gone. And I'm like, this is wonderful. And this is I, wonderful. I did some white box manufacturing for uh, Zero Delta when they came out with their uh, uppers and lowers years ago for uh, SHOT Show. Uh, made those, and I knew quite a few of the guys over there. Do you want your shoes anodized that color? That'd be sick. <laughs> oh, those that. are your matching ones with uh, yeah, the Yeah, my wife and I have uh, matching purple. Don't let my wife listen to this podcast because she always tries that shit. And I'm yeah. like, it's not going to happen. We were looking pretty fly. <laughs> so a guy from Zero Delta calls me like six months later. He's like, hey. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, like, why are you whispering? I was like, I'm working. What? He's like, did you order an anodized tank from, I don't even remember the name of the company. I'm like, yeah, I ordered a whole anodized system. And he's like, I'm at their warehouse because we did too. And we didn't get shit. So I drove up here. He's like, there's a Hilo out here. Can you send a truck? And I'm like, yeah, cool, man. So I sent like a FedEx truck and. He waited, went back into this dude's facility, and loaded up all the tanks. <laughs> He's like, these are mine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're labeled to go to me. The dude just quit answering. And I'm like, okay, cool. Now I have this huge long line of anodized tanks because we're going to do a prototype side. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do the black and, you know, all that fun stuff. And one of the big problems that anodized has is the changeover, right? So if they do that color blue and then they do your color shoe, you know what I mean? They're, they're changing things over and things get all messed up. There's no consistency. Um, so I was like, cool, we'll have little batch tanks that we'll do these things in, and it should be a good time. Um, that's all I got was the tanks. So I literally well, I paid mean, for the anodized system and got tanks, and I just looked at them for like a year, and I was like, cool, I'm just going to give these away for swimming pools for something. I mean, if we actually do a good job and everyone uses us because we do a good job, wouldn't that make sense? Just fucking say, if everyone sucks fucking butts at eating, doing so anodizing. we would be dealing with the ATF and the EPA. Ah, uh, the EPA part. Point. So yeah, no. All right, I know what we I'm can gonna, just dump it into the ditch and it'll go into yeah. The I mean, Hayden, River. Hayden, we have the big ditch. Yeah, Hayden dumps his car batteries in like condoms. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a, ju- that's a fucking joke, people. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is. For I mean, the, the, the I, okay. Fuck you guys. I'm going to start Ian's anodizing, and then you guys can send me all your shit, I'm and I'm going to do a really bro. good job. <laughs> I'm good. That's not something I'll, I don't want to get anywhere oh. near that. Same with grinding. Like uh, everybody asks, like you know, grinding? do you like dancing or like <laughs> grinder? Oh, yeah, okay. you're being me. Okay. Um, but it's the last operation on it's super expensive parts. You know, I'm yeah. like, why don't you do that? I'm like, it's a black magic, and it's like if you're over 62 and you <laughs> run a grinder, it's great. Like there's nobody, no talent coming in that knows that stuff. I would never want that work just sit there and do that last piece on stuff. And for us, most of the stuff gets hard turned, you know, so we can do 99% of what we do. We send out some of the centerless grind and that kind of stuff. But yeah, no thanks. There's, there's witchcraft involved in it. It's like, I'm not, I'm not going to say the guy's name or the company that he worked for, but he literally went from company to company because he had like the anodizing recipe in his head. Oh yeah. And you can tell from company to company where the guy went because that anno went with him. Yeah. And now everybody's like, well, that anode doesn't look like the same anode that you had before. Like, well, not only the anode is different, but the machine shop that's making it all for them is different. And, well, that's why the anode looks different. And like, well, we like the old anode. Well, you're not getting the old anode. I already got my name for my company in my head. Ian Zano. <laughs> Ian Zano? Ian, yeah. Ian Zano. I Ian like that Zano. sound. Just one word. It yeah. flows really good. Yeah. Oh, but I, I do really like seriously like the, these type of conversations and the conversations that you're, you're starting to see in the groups of people understanding, you know, metallurgy and things that are changing where it didn't used to be like that. Like everybody's like, oh, that bull carrier is mil spec. I'm like, none of them are mil spec. I'm like, if you pull up that old ass mil spec print <laughs> and it walks you through the stages <laughs> of manufacturing that part, nobody is doing that anymore. Equipment's evolved, technology's evolved, inserts have evolved. Like none of that's happening. It's like knife groups. They start talking about metallurgy. Oh, that's so good. Well, I mean, just like just like coatings. I mean, so we when we started out with that gentleman that never paid a bill, everything was nickel boron coated, and I was like, this this is complete shit. Like literally, the stack up tolerancing on it. You're polishing the ride surfaces to get things to mate up properly. 
which are the most important parts to be able to have a protective coating on if that's what you're going for. Um, we do a ton of shear tooling for an automotive customer. So that's like tubes and they get in the, these big hammer presses and they come in and they just smash and smash all day long. And they'll run like 300,000 parts on that thing. And I'm like, well, that would probably be pretty good for a bulk carrier. So we started sending all our stuff to get DLC coated. So it's a treatment instead of a coating. It's not mm -hmm. going on the surface. You're not having to alter anything. It comes back dimensionally correct. It's, you know, off the Rockwell scale on the outside while leaving the course off. You know what I mean? So there's there's all these things. And seeing the conversations, you know, the things like Mike's doing on his six project and yeah. changing the metal because of how much your lug's engaging on mm -hmm. that, yeah. that diameter for your lugs. Um and, and people are understanding those conversations, which is, you know, exciting because you should just sit in the groups and I'd be like, just scroll. scroll. Yeah, the consumer is a lot more informed and yes. educated now. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's not, it's refreshing to see. Yeah. There's yeah. still there's still a long way to go, but, like, you know, I think people are, are getting a better look inside what it actually takes. And, well, you, uh, guys, you guys do a really nice job of having, like, a subgroup, right? So way back when, you know, and first starting and you just get into an AR group, you'd be like, hey, I'm going to do this. And you got... 20,000 people that literally shit all over you because yeah. you're an idiot. And then you get subgroups like you guys have, and you're asking a question, and somebody's answering the question, and you're getting an intelligent response, and you get in a, another group, and everybody just wants you to buy whatever they have. Yeah. And, you know, well, you don't have this because that's what I shoot. That's what you do every time. Yeah, they're I like my <laughs> – fucking zombie green hand <laughs> with my red anno safety and charging we, handle we bought uh ascend armory about uh two years ago so they were shit hot selling receiver set doing real well and then um they weren't doing so well on the machine side keeping things up and uh we spent like the past two years th this is how bad i am about manufacturing uh, getting the CAD to match the prints, to match, you know, data, to match samples, to go out on the floor, to be, you know, repeatably machined. You know, we, we ran the first set, and I'm like, oh, I don't really like this, don't like that. Um, the Ambi Bolt catches on them. They sent in, like, a 1,000. I, I threw them all in the trash, remachined them out of a different material. I mean, so, I don't know. It was a little bit different, so. I have another question. It's actually a two-part question. What is, in your opinion, the coolest thing that you make? And if you can say, if you can say, and number two to that is if you were to only make one thing for the rest of the time you work, what would that be? If you want to say that too. Oh, my God. You're like, coolest, I love making fucking bulk Coolest thing. Groups. So just keep in mind, I've made everything from post-rape cameras to like that's not cool no no i'm just saying like i we've made everything so it, it is neat when i go places and i go do things yeah to get on an airplane and go hey we've made that we've yeah, done hell yeah. Yeah. That's, and super, veins. that's super we, cool we, we've done pretty much everything in every industry. today's wi-fi in-flight wi-fi brought to you by yeah day. yeah you know what i don't that's even cool. have like a lifetime password or anything oh <laughs> yeah you should fucking just be like i'm taking this <laughs> yeah, out of your plane <laughs> <laughs> taking my part back you <laughs> fucking dicks but i mean uh, what is the coolest thing? I don't know, man. I, I kind of, it's a process. It's all cool, yeah. It's, it's the process. Like I said, I really like, so one guy was a friend of mine. He was an engineer at another company, and they do, like, automotive, and he's like, I'm burnt out. I don't like this anymore. I'm going to start my own thing, and Michigan is Beer City, and he started a beer can seeming company. <laughs> Right? Nice. So you ever go to a bar and they throw their beer up there and they go, yeah, zip, yeah, zip? Yeah, yeah. That's probably his machine. Oh, that's So cool. when he started out, it was like, hey, I'm going to make like 20 of these. During COVID, the only way that the yeah. place could stay open was selling to-go beer. Yep. So to buy an automated system is like 40 grand a can beer. That's why they always sold this to the growlers. So what he brought to market was this system for you to cost-effectively can and sell beer. So hmm. of selling the growlers. Um, during COVID, I think they were filling like – four ups trucks a day that's like, fucking like, awesome like wow. the semi yeah Cause, yeah because yeah, you get into that and depending on what your state laws and regulations are some place places couldn't do the growlers yep. Yep. right they you had to it was in the legislation that it had to be seamed yep. somehow or in a can yeah the bar couldn't fill up a growler thank so, thank you government overreach so, uh, Thanks, I, 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 I guess the abc my, is like so fucking corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Takes alcohol, all, all yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a 
it's a fucking like mob. Yeah, like yeah, they're all mob. The just the whole distribution. Like, all right, go and get off in a tangent. <laughs> That's never fine. mind. I'm in <laughs> like that. the whole distribution <laughs> system of alcohol in the United States is an absolute racket. Yeah, a legal, government endorsed, government regulated racket. Like what's weird is like Texas. So Texas, everyone like it's a. There's no, like, state liquor stores. Like, going uh, to other states and seeing, like, state-run liquor stores, yeah. that's, like, wild to me. Yeah. So Dude, Texas I think North is, Carolina's like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, I, think, I think that's where I was. I, I walked in, and I'm like, uh, I got beer, but where's your liquor? And they're like, we can't sell it. And I was like, I didn't know, man. <laughs> I can stop yelling. You're yeah. like, I haven't even had one drink yet, and you're yelling at me. Yeah. You take anyway. it easy, Mom. That's cool that, <laughs> that that's cool that he was able to pivot but yeah i mean so i guess the answer to that question is just being part of other companies successes and watching that growth is is my favorite part of it and everybody at the shop knows and it's communicated very well with them of what's happening with our customers where they're going what they're doing um when new projects get in i mean everybody pulls up like your website looks at all the stuff looks at what we're going to be doing um, and just being a small part of that, that's that's the biggest part of our success is being an extension of successful companies. Nice. Uh, and that's if I a good could answer. make one part for the rest of my life, it would probably be just like a square block that's not anodized. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, great. we made 40,000 metal blocks awesome today. It's got awesome tolerances, <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, like, yeah. You're like, the tolerances are my own. I just yeah. kind of do what I want. Here's a cube. It's this yeah. shiny yeah. cube. <laughs> Little. Yeah, and, and, and it's like, you know, you, you'll re-engineer, you'll redo things. Like, we got the titanium drum safety selectors on the new platform that, you know, they're great. Now i got to talk to Mike about his detent that goes in there because that titanium's going to eat up those shitty little brass things super mm-hmm. fast, you know. Yeah. So that evolution never stops. You but can make dice. I've made dice. Yeah, you could just do that for the... They would be really expensive. <laughs> 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 You're like... <laughs> I made uh, titanium <laughs> dice. I'm sure there. there'd be some like gamer nerds that would buy like a whole D and D dice set that was all. I'm sure that's out there. You can get like titanium. You just call me a nerd. Yeah, no, he's a nerd. <laughs> uh, <laughs> certified <laughs> nerds. Oh, I, I I am about the the manufacturing stuff and the machining stuff. Like I said, I mean, no, I it's always dice. evolving. It's always changing. You guys are welcome anytime you come up to Michigan to be cold to yeah. come check it out and you know see how we do things. And next cold. door we got a die cutting facility where we do like all the automotive logos, all the GMC stuff, all that stuff. It's kind of neat to watch that machine just shit out that kind of stuff. And That's, that's super cool. cool. So mm-hmm. what kind of machinery do you have? Like wire EDM, Blaze? Uh, live tooling Blaze. So we went with uh, Mazak on that stuff. So you spend a little bit more money up front, but you have the conversational programming. So like where a lot of shops run like the, the G code. So you're manually like typing everything in and doing all that stuff where maze of troll, you just go in there and you program boom, boom, boom. And then it's, it's very easy to use. Um, so <clears throat> right now we run, obviously it's like some mid volume stuff on the lays. We'll get some orders through like tech pack where they want like 50,000 of a muzzle device or, you know, something like that. So those, that's a bar feeder with live tools. So it's literally clinking out a part. You have a rotor rack on the bottom of that, so it's got a parts catcher that goes, drops it into that rotor rack, and then keeps them all in sequential order, right? Mm -hmm. So you can come in the morning, you're checking your... I'm not lying. Why are you looking at me like I'm lying? Because yeah, I already like have another question in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just see the light bulb. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to know how long it takes to make fifty thousand <laughs> devices. Well, let's do some math there. Cycle okay. time, six minutes yeah. a piece. Do that math while all I right. keep going. So <clears throat> keep some all in subsequent order so you can go through, inspect all your parts, and make sure, oh, from here back had an issue or, yeah. you know, things like that. So conversational programming on a Mazak um, is what we went with there. Uh, they have great training, great support. Uh, they're Japanese-owned but American-made in Kentucky. Um, and then we use a lot of Haas machining centers for the low-volume stuff. Uh, the training's great. You can send the guys out. You got this guy that looks like Colonel Sanders and smokes a pipe and does a really nice job of keeping people educated. So you go level one class, like operator, level two, learning this, level three programming, and, and they do a really good job of that. Um, as far as, like, super tight tolerance, long life stuff, you know, they're obviously not the end-all solution. Uh, pallet pools, we have uh, Kiwas and also a – Okuma line, what is it, that MBX 4000. Um, so those are very high and very tight machines. We're actually putting <clears throat> up another facility with 12 inches of concrete because apparently eight is not enough. 
and we are only able to run those machining centers at like 75 80 percent so that's what they say i'm why, probably gonna why spend can't you do a hundred percent because you can start to feel the floor vibrate and things like it's moving really fast i feel like did you think of your next question yeah why don't we just make a better floor <laughs> so we yeah, can I mean, I'm literally just just pouring that floor is like an extra hundred eighty thousand dollars just to go for thicker concrete, so we can run make another shit. fifty thousand fucking muzzle devices. <laughs> then, so how long does it take? To do well, uh, I don't, I'm not good at math. You're asking the wrong. <laughs> and your calculator and, apparently is not good at math. So fifty thousand <laughs> divided by six <laughs> minutes is eight thousand three hundred thirty-three hours minutes. Minutes. Hours? It, what is hours minutes. or minutes? There's minutes. Minute yeah. hours? And then divide by what? 60? Divided by 60. Okay, yeah. That's the part you were missing. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, 138 hours. Dude, well, thanks math for helping me do math. <laughs> <laughs> how, how it's too early that? for math. <laughs> how many days how is that? Days? Oh, shit. Uh, oh, we got to start over. 138, oh, we know divide that by 24. It's five days. We, we now know why we didn't move Ian yeah, into account. Yeah, that's why I'm not an accountant. Well, actually... Never mind. I won't get into that. Yeah, they kind of want so, it now. I'll I'll leave, I'll leave so, that alone. So, question: Like, how how much does it? So, let's say those muscle devices took eight minutes to run. How yeah. much is how much of a cost difference is it? Is that is that two minutes? Does that account for? I mean, it. Do you want me to that, do that's what you get into. You got your cycle up. time, but then you also have you know QC time, all that kind of stuff, and outside services on those. You know, those always get black nitrided. You know, so. That's not as bad of a service. They usually do a pretty good job on that stuff for us. Um, now I'm going to get – stop yawning You're and lifting. You're boring me. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is very interesting. I just stayed so up too late. those guys do a really nice job. Um, I'm probably going to come back to a bunch of junk parts from them. <laughs> you now. just jinxed yourself. That, yeah, just that up. He's going to leave, get a text. From <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're usually like two weeks out. Um, so that's good. Um, and they do a nice job. How many, how many employees do you have at the shop? Uh, 36 downstairs at oh, uh, wow. manufacturing. Nice. So. How many machines? Uh, 18. Wow. Shout out to the homies in Michigan. Dude, I, I seriously have, like, on the floor is the best staff, the best people, like, you could ever work with. They're all great people. I've known, like, the, the guy that's a quality guy now. You know, we've been friends since we were 15. He worked, nice. He was working, like, uh, concrete, came in at Did he night pour shift. the floors? Uh, you should Fuck get a him. discount. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. But, uh, uh, dude, idea. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's full of them. <laughs> that's why like, we keep them around. Like, you keep them around. <laughs> yeah. There are usually bad ideas. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that whole culture in, in, in family aspect and, you know, family first for them if, if something happens is – is nice and you know they treat me the same and, and it's open door policy i mean i have as you can tell from this conversation and i segue into 30 different things like i have a little bit of add smidge okay. so i'll go in and like puke on the whiteboard of how to even further enhance customer service how yeah. can we get better at this how can we get better at that and put everybody's name on there and what we can do this year to do this and we go through and prioritize it all and you know that's been another focus part of the armament thing is how many phone calls can you take a day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the gun industry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back in 1982, mm -hmm. me and my uncle went out to Montana. Yeah, bro. Yeah. yeah. So great. Love to hear it. But I can take like five phone calls a day. So created a customer service portal. People can log into, have a resolution, have a method of tracking things. Yep. You know? Yeah. That's, that's a big part yep. of it. Yep. Being able to track that, uh, set up the voicemail system so people can just text me. I can respond to hundreds of texts and do all that fun stuff. And, you know, you get the red flag things. Like we were talking earlier about our muzzle device for <clears throat> the Bushmasters. You know, like everybody's like, well, that's probably not a cool button. Like, we sell thousands of those parts because Ruger came out with, I think they were shipping for a while with nothing on them. Mm -hmm. And then they had, like, a birdcage on them. So we sell those, and we sell them threaded for the Bear Creek. We do, I think there's a third company that came out with some off, weird-ass thread. So people tend to order the wrong ones. And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, last month, we literally had the five of those returned completely hammer shit on uh -oh. Like, oh okay so now maybe we need to put in bold and also on the order of confirmation that this is for this and highlight it yeah, call yeah. them <laughs> text yeah. them you know but you, you start to see that pattern and, and really just to be able to enhance the customer service there so that's that's something i really like doing is just the continuous improvement activities in any business you know yeah. so i mean i'm such a nerd when i did a private equity cryptocurrency mining before anybody knew what it was like ETH at like five dollars and 16 cents we raised millions of dollars we built out 
a whole warehouse like bigger than what Putin had uh, to mine cryptocurrency on smart contracts that would automatically send to your wallet based on what you invested your wallet based on what you invested like again nerdy now bro. I'm fucking lost <laughs> <laughs> but but sitting down again and just coming up with the continuous improvement stuff while we're rolling it out yeah. we're building this thing um, that's that's what I really enjoy and and like I said sitting with you guys and chatting about what's the future of this project look like yeah. what are we doing what do we need to focus on because you guys are great at marketing you're great at sales you know what you're selling you know how often you're going to sell these things you know so fun you got any other questions what is the meaning of life what's your biggest fear my biggest fear Ooh, man that's a hard one really yeah it's not for me i I never used to be scared of anything ever like uh, i don't know my biggest fear so i had like i said kid when i was young so i got a 26 year old daughter and then i just had i got a a beautiful covid child so i have a two almost two year old now. nice yeah and i'm just like when you're like 17, 18, you got a kid, you don't think about shit, right? Yeah. You're just like, life. Like, I got to work 60 hours and I got to go build decks on the weekend and try to hustle and make this money, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah now I'm just like walking my daughter down the stairs like, God, I hope I make it to her wedding. <laughs> I'm so old. <laughs> you're not that old. Do you see I have gray hairs? I got fucking gray hairs. <laughs> my wife makes fun of me daily about them. <laughs> Chris doesn't even have hair. <laughs> That's like Josh asked this morning. Hey, man, you got any hairspray? I just looked at him. Like, motherfucker. Yeah. He's, he's, like, like, he's like, I'm going to leave this room right now before it happens. Oh oh, damn, I don't know what my biggest fear is. What's your biggest fear? I, I don't yeah. Mine? Yeah. Dude, I got two small kids as well. Yeah. Like, I got a five-year-old and a seven, uh, nine-year-old. It's weird. Dude, right? Like, every day, like. But when I was 17, 18, I never even yeah. thought about any of that shit. Yeah. Now I'm just like, like I said, I'm walking down the stairs and I'm just holding her. I'm like, God, I, I hope I'm at her wedding. I hope all these things are great. Yeah. Like crazy. So dropping off, I mean, for instance, that, that whole thing, like dropping off the kids at school the other day. And, and that usually f- means pooping, but go Right. On. But yeah. <laughs> but like literally dropping the kids off at school before heading <laughs> yeah, into yeah. work. You know, uh, like it's, it's Texas law now that there's got to be some sort of security at the school. Mm-hmm. Right. There's got to be armed security at the school, whether it's police officer uniformed ununiformed whatever there's got to be armed security at the school which is cool yeah. i'm glad they finally just made it to where they have to do it uh i did not know that happened yeah and so know. we have a uniformed police officer at yeah. the front door like every county every yeah day. yeah every day that i don't know who's paying for that but somebody's paying for it anyway <laughs> either way taxes are out of our pocket uh my oldest goes daddy why do we have a police officer now at school i was like well he's here to protect you and she goes because you're not yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. What's your biggest fear? Oh, I don't know. You do. You read all the time, bro. <laughs> you got to marinate on that kind of right. stuff. Most people tell me clowns are some dumb shit. You're going to tell me clowns. And I'm gonna... No, it's not clowns. I just shoot him in the face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's why I carry a gun. Probably my wife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm scared to death of that. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. Like, I don't have any kids yet, but, yeah. like, uh, you know, I want kids someday. So, yeah, yeah like, making it to, yeah. to their wedding or yeah. some just, like, like oh. not seeing like I would like to be a grandpa one day too. Yeah. Just I don't yeah. know. You're gonna make me cry now. Yeah, well, yeah. You're make me cry. We get weird all the time. Yeah, yeah. let's segue into a bunch of dumb shit. We can, we can eat I'll, some edibles <laughs> and get weird. I'll, I'll mute Ike on this, but dude, I that can be responsible for like how many co- employees you got right now? Uh, twenty three. Twenty three. Twenty two. Like. That's a huge responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's that's the way I always look at things is like I'm not keeping food on my family's table. I'm keeping food on collectively before all the companies, probably about 60 people's families. Yeah. But then know. also there's second and third order effects too. Like, yeah. I mean, the stuff that you do helps keep other people employed. Like, yeah. you know, there's a huge sphere of influence that you have, not just directly, but like. They say, they say every job that we create creates eight trickle down mm-hmm. in the studies that you see in the economic stuff in Michigan. So anodizers yeah Yeah, because they run parts three times (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, laser engraving that kind of stuff the assembly companies and Mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a lot of good shit that that's flowed down from what we do yeah because if if i didn't and i'm not i'm not sucking up here but like if i didn't work for you right (laughs) if i didn't work for you i couldn't do i couldn't pick the kids up i couldn't drop them off i couldn't be flexible at what i do work-wise you know like, there's a huge impact okay. that working for big tech's ordinance has in my life, other than, according to Charlie, me working with my best friend. Yeah. So. Me and Charlie are tight. Yeah. <laughs> Shout so, out to Charlie. Yeah. So, that, I mean, there's. Yeah. I've, it's I've, cool. I've had those weird, weird moments where, like, a large company is like, hey, 
we want to come in and buy you. So there was a company that bought a bunch of companies in the firearms industry <laughs> and they came in to look at us and uh, had made offers and we had conversations and one of the conversations was your products will fly off the shelves. You just aren't a marketing machine. We just yeah. need to get this shit. But we're going to basically shut your Michigan down yeah. and move it out to wherever they may be. I'm sure you know. China. No, not there, oh. but close. Um, so I, I just look at that like, like I said, they, they the guys get that profit sharing. They, you know, hey, I'm taking my family to Disney. Hey, yeah. I'm doing this, you know. So, you know, for me to look at, you know, this quick cash out type of thing and private equity buyouts and stuff, it's not something I'm ever interested in. And I've had the offers from other large companies to come turn them around. And I'm like, I couldn't think of a worse job to have. <laughs> like to walk in and do an evaluation and be the bobs from office space and just sit down. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me what you do. <laughs> yeah. And just be like, okay, I just picked out six people to ruin their lives. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah, the using your, your business superpower to create jobs instead of eliminate them and make large companies, you know, yeah. more profitable. I, I really like being in the small business space. I do a lot of volunteering for the SBA. So mm. Actually, when I had my federal contracting company, they called me. I knew the the guy down at the university hosts like our SBA, and uh, he says, "Hey, I don't want to create a competitor for you, but there's this lady that really wants to get into federal contracting." I said, "Do you know how much money they spend? Like, I'm not directly competing with this lady on <laughs> anything. You could be doing the exact same <laughs> yeah. thing, and you oh, don't 100%. worry about it." But it was cool. She went on to become like minority woman supplier of the year. You know what I mean? It's just sitting down, coming up with processes and and doing all that stuff with them is, you know, it's fun. I I really enjoy it. So startup stuff, that's good. We got to get you and Brendan on a plane to go up there and tour the facility. I want to go too, though. I'll I'll go on a different plane. You got to go on a different plane. (laughs) (laughs) We were explaining that to somebody. Last uh, night. The continuity of, uh, of leadership or whatever they call it. Oh, yeah. Uh, last night at, at the Leatherneck, somebody was like, I'm like, well, why did y'all take three different flights? I was like, because if one goes down, yeah. we still got somebody yeah, here. The Leonard Skinner. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally said <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy. I said Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix. And they're like, uh, and I, was they're like, like uh, I was like, no, I Leonard Skinner, my bad. Yeah. 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 yeah, that'd be great. Like I said, I love giving the tours, love doing that stuff. And. You know, we're really focused on, you know, working with you guys and then like companies to be able to, you know, support the brand and have good representation and good staff. That's it's it's really, really rare. We have a, a few companies that we work with that I know they're doing a great job for the brand. If something happens, you know, we always look at it as an opportunity to improve or get better. Or, you know, I had a guy that was having an issue with a part that was not our issue called them work through the issue i'm finishing gunsmith school right now the only parts i'm going to use on my shit is yours you know turning that negative into positive is something that you guys are fantastic at and again same thing as the other business we just try to be an extension of you guys you know so looking forward to doing that more and getting some more product pushed your guys's way and starting to work yeah cool man well if you ever need an anodizer look up my shop (laughs) (laughs) ian's anna coming soon Uh, he's like out there in like a Rubber made container trying to figure <laughs> yes. out how to fucking, fucking do it. Kill myself. You're gonna shock the shit out of yourself. I bet you guys went to bed the same time I was getting up. Yeah, Chris and I. I was his jetpack last night. Yeah. So, yeah, we went to bed together. Two. Well, well, well midnight. We're just after midnight. We hit. Yeah. yeah, I woke up at one in the morning. I had some teams calls and oh shit wow, like that that yeah, is. We got customers in Malaysia. We do some exporting of the firearms too and shit like that. So, I always get weird hours from Malaysia. Calls. I need your exporter info. <laughs> Did you watch the? Uh, Malaysian Airlines documentary on Netflix, the flight that went missing. Yeah, did conspiracy. Yeah, did you have a? I just watched Wi-Fi plate on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the Choctaw Chakwa tea or whatever? Did you see that one? No. The school bus that went missing in 1976. No. What is this? Yeah, on? I never heard of it because I wasn't born. My daughter thought like I was around for it. She's like, <laughs> "Do you remember <laughs> Were this?" Were you on the school bus? <laughs> I was like, "No." Yeah, like 26 kids went like missing on a school bus. Like, what they, is this? What what channel is this? This on? was on HBO Max. Oh. So then, like, okay. they found the bus. Like, they flew overhead and found it, and then they couldn't find the kids. And uh, the kids were buried underground in, like, a storage container at a rock quarry. What the fuck? (laughs) Yeah, it was super crazy. But the craziest part is, so the dude that arranged it, they said he was doing it to uh, create a ransom. But he's, like, what was it? His family was, like, the most wealthy family from the original gold rush and bought, like, 1,900 acres in California. 
his trust that was separate from everybody else's was still a hundred million dollars. So they're like, did he do this for money? So they ended up like one of the kids was like 12 on the bus or 14. He ended up digging like these kids out and was like this superhero cowboy ass dude out there, a small town rodeo guy. And he got all the kids out and they go back to town and he goes to tell what happened. And they're like, just go home, go to bed. Don't talk to reporters. So then they thought the bus driver saved all the kids. So they, like, have a memorial, like, every year, like, hey, hero guy, and he really didn't do anything. He's just sitting on the thing like this, like, the kid actually saved all the other kids. Then he became an alcoholic. It's a really sad story. <laughs> well, do you want me to keep going? <laughs> There's a lot of twists to this story. Yeah. yeah. The last twist that blew my mind was getting them out of prison. <clears throat> So I ju- the, the kidnappers. Ki- oh, I thought you meant all, like all the twenty six kids got, <laughs> oh, got, no. got locked they, up. For I think some a reason. couple did end up doing prison from the trauma. They were they were pretty hard. Wait, I need to write this down because I need to. Wa- what's it called? We'll put Wait. a link in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, link yeah. A, link in the comments. <laughs> that is. So they end up like the three kidnappers go to prison, and every year they go to get out. Like one of the victims shows up, and they're like, <laughs> "Not no. today." Yeah, not today. Well, there ended up being this super powerful political judge out in California that spoke on their behalf and finally got them out of jail. So then they guess ca- who it was? The judge? Yes, the judge. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Gavin Newsom's dad. Dun dun dun. Interesting. Very much so. Interesting. Makes you think. Let's talk about politics. Al- Illuminati. <laughs> we won't even get in there. Open your eyes. Ra- your ra- oh, <laughs> Illuminati. Goodness. Where's our tinfoil hats? <laughs> we'll do, do that. Thank you for your time. I yeah, love thank hanging you so out. You guys are cool on. shit. So maybe we'll swing down before NRA a couple days early, run over to the range. Oh, hell yeah. Some things, yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Sounds like a blast. Sure. Yeah, do you, you want to roll this out since you tour my anodizing shop? What? You can tour my anodizing shop. It's just like out in the back, got all these little <laughs> buckets and buckets and little batteries. batteries. <laughs> Hayden's used car batteries. <laughs> He's sticking them out of like the lake. He's like, oh, this one's still good. Uh, well, anyways, uh, if you're still here, I uh, managed to make it through all that. Thank you for watching, listening. However, you're consuming this podcast, um, go check out Next Level Armament, and then I guess if you need stuff made, Next Level Manufacturing. Um, and then also Ian's anodizing shop uh, <laughs> coming soon. That's going to happen. <laughs> it's awesome. It's it now. But thank you all for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Tell your mom. Tell your friends. All that good stuff. Uh, Ian? Uh, definitely tell your moms. We like moms. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> we'll see you all next time. Thanks, guys.